This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, special episode for May 6th, 2009, from New York City. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm talking with Dr. Peter Palese. He's chairman and professor of microbiology at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine here in New York City. Dr. Palese is an expert on influenza viruses and has agreed to chat with us today about the influenza H1N1 virus that is currently circulating globally. Thanks for agreeing to talk to me today, Peter. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I wanted to talk about uh, the new influenza virus, H1N1, and uh, the listeners of This Week in Virology, my podcast, are pretty knowledgeable about viruses. So I want to really focus on the virus and its biology uh, and the science, if you will. Sure. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions that's always arising is this is called an H1N1 influenza virus. And, you know, there have been previous H1N1 strains as well. So how does this relate to them? So we have currently regular influenza, during the regular influenza virus season, we have actually three different influenza viruses. We have the H1N1, the H3N2, both of them are influenza A viruses, and then we have an influenza B virus. So these two, these three uh, different strains make up the three flavors which are circulating during the winter period from about November to March over the last uh, at least 10 years. Two influenza A viruses, one influenza B virus. And uh, the new thing was that about maybe 14 days ago, two weeks ago, another H1N1 virus was reported in patients, particularly in Mexico and also in, in California. So this H1N1 virus, this new H1N1 virus, has one component, the hemagglutinin, which is very similar to the hemagglutinin of swine viruses. And that's why it was called uh, the swine virus. And I like to use this uh, name as we discuss this virus because it is actually distinct from the current H1N1 virus, which is circulating also in the human population. So is the fact that they're both H1, does that imply any antigenic cross-reactivity between the two? There is clearly an H1N1 similarity. In other words, the hemagglutinin of all H1 strains is fairly is, is much more similar than the hemagglutinin, the H1 hemagglutinin to an H2 or an H3, a different subtype. So yes, the swine virus, the H1N1 swine virus, has similarities with the current seasonal H1N1 virus. And therefore, people, and we all have been exposed to the regular seasonal H1N1 virus, and there is some herd immunity in the population against the uh, seasonal influenza viruses. And we can be certain that there is some cross protection, some cross-reactive immunity in the human population against this H1N1 virus, which is uh, also the hallmark or is sort of the characteristic of the swine virus. So yes, uh, there is some cross-protection. How much yeah, is a little bit of a question. In other words, uh, is it, it's certainly not full protection because people do get infected, but I think it will result in a dampening of uh, the virulence and pathogenicity of this new swine virus. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the CDC has said they wouldn't expect uh, to see any protection from in people who were infected with the previous season H1N1 against this. But it seems to me yes. that th that remains to be seen, right? I, I have, I have uh, heard about this, and I think what one can... Uh, what, okay, it depends how much yeah, uh, protection one uh, wants to see. I think what the uh, CDC is saying, in order to really have good protection, 
we have to make a vaccine. So they are really concerned that people are saying, okay, this is just an H1N1 virus and uh, we don't have to worry. Clearly, uh, these new H1N1 viruses are causing disease and uh, I would sort of see it as a sort of a cautionary uh, statement by the CDC that they really uh, would like to uh, make people aware that in order to be fully protected, we need a specific vaccine made against that swine virus, right. not uh, rely on the partial cross-reactivity with the current uh, vaccine. I see. So I got an email from someone who said they were a recruit in 1976 and they had gotten infected with swine influenza virus in that episode. And Would, would that confer some partial protection as well? The 1976 swine virus was another example of a swine virus jumping into humans. And uh, as you mentioned, there were uh, 40 million people vaccinated. However, this goes really, this is now more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. So the immunity uh, which was afforded by this vaccination would certainly have gone down by now. And also, uh, from we looked at the sequence of the New Jersey swine uh, virus, which is again different. It almost forms a triangle in terms of relatedness. So the uh, the current swine virus is almost is as much or has a, as many differences to the New Jersey swine virus as it has to regular H one N one strain circulating. So it's really sort of almost a, a triangle in terms of. Um, a, a, genetic distances mm. between among those three viruses. So I presume that the 1918 would be even further uh, antigenically from, from this one. Correct. The 1918 is even even um, more distantly related. But uh, the uh, they, they precursor to all of these H1N1 viruses, the swine virus from 2009, our current H1N1 viruses, and the New Jersey H1N1 virus from 1976, they are all derived from the 1918 virus. Right. Now, um, I understand that um, this virus, although it's, it's, it's a swine virus and resembles viruses that are in pigs, uh, actually has some uh, RNA segments from avian and human strains, which it have went into pigs, I think, in the 1990s. Is that correct? Uh, that's that's correct. Yes. So this is really a triple reassortment, meaning the virus has the swine virus from 2009 has actually sequences which were derived from uh, three different uh, influenza viruses: avian influenza virus, human influenza virus, and uh, and the swine influenza viruses. Now, I remember uh, in 1976, that H1 used to be called H1SW. Is that correct? Yes. So, uh, is that what we call the classical swine uh, H1N1? Yes. I mean, this is the 1976 swine virus was actually a true uh, classical swine virus, which uh, jumped directly from swine into humans. So, uh, that virus was actually shown to circulate uh, several years before that in the uh, swine population. That is 1976, uh, several years before that. And uh, it is also known that in 1918, the human influenza virus jumped into pigs during that period of time and then was propagated for several decades in the swine population. And this antigenically drifted uh, human 1918 virus then uh, was uh, uh, jumping into humans in, the, in 1976. So is it fair to say that the H1 of this 2009 swine virus is, is more similar to the avian H1s than to the 1976 swine H1? Can you repeat the question, sure. please? So is it fair to say that the, the hemagglutinin, the H1 of the 2009 swine flu is more similar to avian H1s from that went into pigs in the 90s rather than the H1 from 1976, say? Uh, that would be correct, yes. But the, it's a little bit confusing when you then call the swine HA of the swine virus an avian one. Sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a way, you're absolutely right. I mean, this just uh, highlights 
what's going on with influenza virus is that there is a jumping of, if not complete viruses, but certainly of genes of influenza viruses from one species to the other. Right. I mean, so from my reading of the literature, it seems that from about 1918 till somewhere in the 90s, I think, these classical swine viruses were constant in pigs. But then in the 90s or earlier, perhaps, bird and human influenza viruses began to in infect pigs. And do we have any understanding of why that began to occur at that time? Not really. I think this is a very good question. It may have to do that there is, there was an increase in the number of uh, pigs and swines worldwide. This was a time when uh, the economies in uh, Asia really took off. And it is known, for example, that the poultry uh, industry and the number of chicken in the world, I mean, uh, is probably 10 times higher now than it was only 25 years ago. So it might be that there were more animals, there was a bigger substrate mm. for influenza <laughs> viruses, and that may have contributed right. to this uh, uh, sort of increased mixing of uh, influenza viruses in the pig population. So the unique aspect of this virus, from what, what I understand, and you tell me if this is wrong, is that it has sequences from Eurasian and North American swine flu viruses. Is that right? Correct, yes. Do we have any idea how this uh, mixture occurred and where? When uh, genes get shuffled, this is always the result of a co-infection of a single cell with, let's assume, a Eurasian pig virus with a avian virus. And this can happen either in a pig, it could have happened in a bird, or even in a human cell. So the even though pigs have been postulated to be a good mixing vessel because they have receptors, pigs that is, in their respiratory tract, they have receptors which allow the growth of both avian and uh, more uh, mammal and mammalian influenza viruses. The uh, actual site or the actual species where this mixing and co-infection of influenza viruses from different species occurs is not completely clear. But I think uh, assuming that it happened in a pig is probably not uh, out of the question. So I understand there's going to be an increased surveillance of pigs and isola virus isolations and sequencing. So maybe we'll be able to find uh, something related to this uh, from that work. Absolutely. I think uh, it is important to really uh, do the surveillance, and the NIH is actually funding a lot of groups worldwide, not only in the U.S., uh, looking at uh, different influenza viruses in different species. Uh, obviously, uh, the pig, uh, the swine is getting more attention, but uh, the surveillance covers uh, many other avian spe many avian spe species as well uh, as um, uh, pigs, horses, uh, dogs. And uh, there is quite a lot of work going on worldwide in terms of trying to understand where these viruses, where the reservoir for these viruses is, and where, as we discussed before, such a reassortment may take place. Yeah, it's a good time to be going into virology for all of the postdocs and graduate students out there. There's plenty of work to do, it sounds. There is, uh, I think it's a very good time for young people. There are many jobs, whether in industry, vaccine uh, manufacturing, surveillance, uh, Center for Disease Control has very interesting positions. Uh, the FDA is expanding, uh, also lo uh, regional and state uh, laboratories are very interested in uh, these viruses in, vir in virology per se. So I think this is a very good time for people uh, with this training. One more thing about the, the pigs. I heard that in Canada that this virus had been reintroduced into a pig herd. And uh, so that's a concerning issue, I'm sure. And it, it brings up the question of whether this virus would get back into pigs and somehow recombine with, say, avian H5 viruses and produce something different. Would, is, is that possible? Right now, the swine virus really looks as very similar to other H1N1 viruses, clearly having received genes or acquired genes from uh, viruses from different species. So in a way, uh, the answer to your question 
could this virus, the swine virus, acquire uh, either new mutations or could it acquire a different gene or more, uh, several genes from influenza virus from a different species and thereby acquire new and uh, higher virulence cannot be excluded. So yes, influenza viruses always have the possibility via mutation or reassortment, that is uh, shuffling of genes from different influenza viruses to change their virulence. But that is not uh, limited or is not uh, possible not only with the current new swine virus, but is also possible with the other uh, 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 H1N1, H3 and 2, as well as influenza B viruses to a certain extent. So I'm not sure that we should be, we should be always cautious and uh, be aware that influenza viruses may, that influenza may have some surprises in store for us, but I'm not sure that there is uh, an increased possibility that the present swine virus would undergo those changes leading to a, let's say, killer virus. Now, this uh, so far I see there are less than 2,000 lab-confirmed cases globally, I think. This virus is different from other swine viruses in that it's been able to spread from person to person. So by looking at the sequences, do we have under any clue as to why that might be? Okay, so clearly what uh, is important for an influenza virus is that, one, it is transmissible from one person to the other, but the second also is that it has uh, a virulence characteristics. And in the case of the H1N1 swine virus, there is obvious evidence that the virus can be transmitted from one person to the other. However, this swine virus lacks certain virulence characteristics and virulence genes, which have been shown to be present in highly virulent uh, influenza viruses. And uh, one major gene which confers higher virulence is a gene coding for about uh, 80 amino acids, and this is referred to as PB1F2. This is sort of lab uh, jargon. PB1 is the one RNA, one component of the polymerase, and F2 stands for frame 2, open reading frame 2. So there is a protein which is expressed in highly virulent viruses, that is, for example, the 1918 virus, the pandemic strain from 1957, the H2N2, Asian flu, and is also present in the 1968 Hong Kong flu, which also caused a worldwide uh, epidemic, pandemic. So in all of these pandemic influenza virus strains from the last century, they all have PB1F2. The new swine virus is lacking this PB1F2. So that, I think, is another sort of important um, difference to the previous pandemic uh, viruses which caused a lot of disease and death, that uh, this current one, even though it is transmitting very well, is lacking uh, a virulence characteristic, namely is not expressing the PB1F2, and that I think makes this a much more mellow virus uh, than uh, it could be and than other highly pathogenic influenza viruses were. So how many mutations would it take to have these viruses make a PB1F2? It would be at least uh, three to four uh, point mutations. So in uh, do viruses want to evolve to be, become more virulent, do you think? Is this something that you expect might happen for these viruses? I think we can't exclude it, but there are many of the H1N1 viruses which are currently circulating in the human population. The other seasonal H1 also do not contain oh, okay. uh, the PB1F2. That's a good so point. So yeah. it's not necessarily uh, a. I mean, I believe, and I think we all believe in Darwinian uh, selection uh, and uh, uh, increased fitness that uh, this is sort of a biological principle. But on the other hand, uh, there, uh, it is not necessarily true that uh, a higher virulence may be associated, for example, with better transmissibility. There may be other complex characteristics as a result of this PB1F2, which make it 
difficult for the swine virus to actually continuously express such a PB1F2. Yeah, it's an interesting question whether, for example, you can imagine that increased virulence would make you sneeze or cough more. In that case, it could help transmit the virus better. But if it kills you too quickly, that's not good. So there has to be some kind of a balance. Correct. How about NS1? Now, you've shown that this is an interferon antagonist. Is this NS1 look... uh, like it has any unusual properties? So far, we have, by just looking at the sequence, we were not able to see anything staring into our eyes. But the very uh, you pointed out uh, that the NS1 is a virulence gene because it can overcome the interferon response of the host and thereby can uh, counteract the a defense mechanism of an infected cell. So the, clearly that would be another uh, protein uh, we should look at in terms of comparing the swine H1N1 NS1 protein or NS1 gene with other NS1 uh, genes, which we have studied in the past. And there are probably other genes as well that have virulence determinants, I think. I think the P- Absolutely. And for example, the uh, hemagglutinin in the H5N1 in the famous chicken uh, influenza viruses, with influenza virus, which caused a lot of disease and death in the poultry population. So these viruses all have a basic peptide in the hemagglutinin, and the result of such a basic peptide is that the cleavage between in the some between uh, HA1 and HA2 is rapidly occurring in these chicken viruses, and this actually leads to a more uh, ready, a, a more effective replication in uh, many uh, host cells, and such a virus is more virulent than one which doesn't contain this basic peptide. And again, the swine virus does not have a mm-hmm. basic peptide in the hemagglutinin. Right, great. Now, uh, I, as you know, there are sequences of many, many isolates already available, which to me is amazing. Uh, I think back to 1968 where we couldn't sequence anything, and now we have sequences within a day, so there are hundreds. But looking at these, they all look very similar. And to my eye, there's no reason to think that the viruses from Mexico are any different from viruses that are anywhere else in the world, which brings up the question, why have there been 29 deaths in Mexico and very few elsewhere? Do you have any idea about that? So this was certainly disturbing to hear that so many people died of this uh, new uh, swine virus. But what we don't know is how many people in Mexico have been infected aclinically or subclinically. So that the denominator may be large. Mm -hmm. If it is a million people, for example, I don't know if this number is correct. But then if you have uh, 100 deaths, for example, then that number would not be so unusual as compared to regular swine, uh, I'm sorry, regular H1 influenza, H1N1 influenza. Uh, We have about 30,000 deaths in the United States in a regular influenza virus season caused by infection with regular H1N1, regular H3N2, and regular influenza B viruses. So the question of is the Mexican swine virus more virulent than other currently circulating influenza viruses, I think has to, uh, I think it's an important question, but the answer to that question has to wait until we really know how widely spread that virus was. And also, uh, the numbers are still small. One has to find out whether there were super infections uh, in these uh, super infection with bacterial strains in those patients who died, and whether uh, there was uh, any other exacerbating uh, situation like uh, malnutrition, etc. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that this happened initially because it scared a lot of people. And if you had taken Mexico out of the equation, then there would be much less uh, panic and hype, I think, globally about this virus. Absolutely. You are right. And uh, there is, I think, uh, somewhat of a hype going on and somewhat of a panic uh, in uh, looking at this virus. Certainly, uh, I was uh, traveling uh, last week and went into a supermarket and there were uh, 
every all the pork products were on on sale. You, know, <laughs> you could get uh, uh, pork cutlets for uh, a third of the price. Sausages, anything having uh, uh, swine products were on sale, suggesting that people don't buy uh, pork. Uh, there is absolutely no reason why w- uh, one should not. If one eats pork, one should not continue to do so. Yeah, I think there are similar issues with chicken when there when there are outbreaks of avian viruses in chicken farms. People tend not to want to buy chicken for a while, right? <laughs> Correct. Uh, that is certainly not justified. Um, one thing I heard the other day from WHO is that a spokesman said that there is an unusual amount of diarrhea and gastrointestinal symptoms associated with this influenza. And this really disturbs me. Because I I know in humans that this is not an enteric virus. So what's that a consequence of? I think uh, these reports uh, have to be confirmed that they are not uh, really only anecdotal reports, but that they are real numbers in terms of how many people uh, have been uh, checked, whether they are really hospitalized and whether there are any uh, samples available. There is... There are some reports that, for example, H5N1 viruses Mm -hmm. in Vietnamese patients were isolated from feces. So these are very, very rare examples where a virus is found outside the respiratory tract. And uh, clearly, uh, if that is true, if that can be confirmed, it would be something disturbing and unusual. But I think uh, the jury is still out on that question. So the avian viruses have a broader tropism, right, because of the cleavage site? Yes, and they are infecting a, com- a completely different animal yeah. Yeah, other right. than human. Yeah. But the H1N1, the H3N2 viruses don't have the ability to grow in the intestine, right? Uh, they have... Uh, in the human intestine. In, in the human intestine, they do not, and the the only recent report is associated with these very few cases of H5N1 infections in uh, very sick uh, patients in Vietnam. Right. So, in kids who get diarrhea, it must be it may be a another a bacterial infection or perhaps even a cytokine that that causes the diarrhea, but not viral replication, right? Absolutely, yes. Right. No, there's no evidence that virus, that regular influenza viruses can be isolated either from serum, from blood, or from feces, and there's no evidence that they replicate in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, I noticed that these uh, H1N1 swine viruses are, the 2009 variety, are resistant to amantadines, which was interesting to me. Is that because the the amantadines are used in pigs, or is there another reason? The M gene is derived from uh, swine viruses, from uh, influenza viruses in swine. Mm -hmm. So uh, that could be one of the explanations. There are, however, other uh, human influenza viruses which carry a human M gene, namely the H3N2 viruses, and they are also, most of them in the 2009 series, we are also amantadine resistant. So it's not, and there is no evidence that the H3N2 viruses, the regular ones, had any uh, pig connection. And even in those viruses, we feel, we, we, we uh, found that they are, the majority of them is amantadine resistant. That is the drug used in pig farms, do you know? Uh, not in the U.S., but uh, there are uh, rumors that in Asia, amantadine, because it is so cheap, uh, is widely used in, the, in agriculture, including chicken uh, farms as well as mm. uh, pig farms. I, I saw some papers from quite some time ago where they surveyed pig influenza isolates, I think from the 70s or 80s, and they, they randomly found... Uh, amantadine resistance, and uh, they suggested that it may be just a, a random event, that you, by chance you have the right mutation in the M2, and that does it. I think that cannot be excluded. Yeah. Now, the other, the uh, norminidase inhibitors will inhibit this new virus, correct? Uh, the, it, it's correct. The new swine viruses, in contrast to the regular H1N1 viruses of the seasonal influenza, the swine viruses are sensitive to amantadine. I'm sorry, to the neuraminidase inhibitor Tamiflu. 
And so that is going to be used in certain situations, I presume, to ameliorate infections. Absolutely, yes. Do you think that'll lead to rapid resistance, or is that something that will take longer? I think uh, the reason the H1N1 viruses carry Tamiflu resistance right now has nothing to do with the usage of this drug. It has to do with a with a mutation which got fixed because the hemagglutinin also changed. Mm -hmm. So there was a balancing between the hemagglutinin change and the neuraminidase mm -hmm. so that there is uh, that this was really not uh, induced by the use of medication. In the case of the swine H1N1 viruses, the future will tell whether the uh, whether a resistant, a neuraminidase resistant, or a neuraminidase resistant to Tamiflu, whether that uh, is a viable virus, one, or a virus which has uh, a lesser fitness. So this is not clear yet, and I think uh, uh, that will be important to find out experimentally also, and uh, it may very well be that Tamiflu resistance with the new swine virus results in a lower transmissibility and a lesser fitness of the virus. Yes, in fact, you've shown in your guinea pigs that uh, the human H1N1s with, that are resistant to Tamiflu don't transmit very well, right? So we, we, we actually demonstrated this with H3N2 viruses, mm -hmm. and uh, that really led to a major loss in fitness of a virus which had gained resistance to a drug, but it also lost a lot of its pizzazz, so mm. to speak. So that could be a silver lining in the, in the resistance then? Correct. So in a way, yes, uh, it takes away uh, the, the advantages we have using an antiviral. But on the other hand, if the virus becomes so attenuated, so weakened, that it is actually not a, a real danger anymore in terms of causing a lot of disease. The last thing I want to talk to you about is a uh, vaccine. I understand that uh, a vaccine is already being produced against this new uh, H1N1 virus. Now, from my old days in influenza, I remember that to produce vaccines in eggs, you have to make a high-yielding recombinant. Is that still done, and is that going to be done with this virus? There are uh, efforts underway to make influenza virus vaccines which are based upon the new swine H1 and N1 surface glycoproteins and the manufacturing, it, uh, depending whether it's a killed influenza virus vaccine or a live influenza virus vaccine, involves making either high-yielding uh, reassortant viruses, and that can be done in several ways by uh, making reassortants in the laboratory. In terms of the live uh, influenza virus vaccines, these new Swine hemagglutinin and swine neuraminidase genes have to be grafted onto a cold adapted backbone, and uh, vaccines are being made as we speak uh, in uh, companies which are geared up to make either killed influenza virus vaccines or live influenza virus vaccines. And that uh, is important that we are prepared whether these vaccines will ever be used in the future is uh, still a question. Uh, it might very well be that the swine virus in the northern hemisphere sort of just declines so that we won't have many more cases uh, next week or two weeks from now, and that also no new cases occur and emerge in the southern hemisphere. And mm. so it could very well be that uh, the, uh, influenza, the swine influenza virus is dying out uh, both in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere, and then uh, uh, any kind of vaccine which has been produced would probably not be um, administered to the population. I think stockpiling and uh, watchful waiting, I think, is a better strategy in this case rather than vaccinating uh, a portion of the population just in case such a virus might take. Mm. So if this, if this uh, virus declines in the northern hemisphere, which we would expect because it's the end of the flu season, uh, and then takes off in the southern hemisphere, that would be uh, evidence to use the vaccine in the northern hemisphere back in the fall again, right? Absolutely. I think this would be the sign and the signal 
which uh, would uh, make us to uh, uh, which would per, uh, persuade us to really uh, get uh, a fourth vaccine strain for the upcoming season. So you think the uh, the existing strain, uh, the the three the trivalent vaccine, which is now being prepared for use here in the fall, that would also be used in conjunction with the new one? I think, uh, I mean, predictions are always difficult <laughs> sure. to make, especially about the future. There is, uh, there is no reason to believe that these regular three influenza viruses, regular H1N1, H3, and 2 and B, would die out suddenly in the next uh, hmm. season. And uh, so those three, I think, are given more or less for the upcoming 2009-2010 influenza season. The question is really whether a monovalent fourth uh, influenza virus vaccine should be given, uh, which is made against the swine H1N1 virus. Is, so isn't it true that when you have a new pandemic strain that it replaces the previous circulating one? This happened uh, in... 1957, when an H2N2 strain replaced the H1N1. Uh, however, uh, we have uh, two different subtypes circulating since 1977. So it, I think, is again very difficult to predict whether we will uh, enter an era of four different influenza virus strains or whether the swine virus will replace the either the H1N1 or H3 and 2 as well. So I think uh, it's an uh, interesting question, and we really have to wait what the winter season in the southern hemisphere shows, whether there will be four strains circulating or whether three or only one or two. I think all of the above is possible, but I think the more likely event is that we just uh, will have the three regular ones and i think there's a 50 50 chance that this uh, swine virus may actually persist hmm. that's that would be unprecedented from my meager uh, knowledge of influenza that it's very unusual is that there are many possible reasons and you know the farming business is possibly part of it but it could it also be that our surveillance is so much better than it was in 1968 that we can pick up other strains circulating that we not would not have before? At this point, you're absolutely right. I think uh, it's not clear whether 20 or 30 years ago one would have even realized a, an event such as a swine virus. However, the swine virus may really become more prevalent than it is right now. And then I think uh, surveillance was not that bad 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah. So if one would really have, let's say, like 10 or 20 percent of all the influenza virus strains would be the swine virus, I think one would have seen that also uh, several decades ago. But at this point, I'm not sure uh, that we uh, would have picked it up with methodologies which were prevalent, uh, which were available uh, several decades ago. So it sounds to me like that you're not convinced that this is the next pandemic strain. Is that right? Yes, I think this is still uh, uh, an open question. I think it's really a 50-50 chance that the swine virus will uh, actually die out you know, and not mm. become a prevalent strain in the next season. And we'll know that in the next few months, I suppose, in the southern... I think we probably... I think the first sort of... Uh, uh, event to watch is what happens in the next week or, a week or two in our northern hemisphere and then certainly what will happen in a month or two uh, in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, will more or less define and uh, define the probability whether that virus will be prevalent in the wintertime in 2009-2010. I think this is a very exciting time to be in virology. Here we can watch a, uh, a new virus and whether it spreads or not, and we have great scientific tools to study it. And I think uh, more people need to go into virology and because uh, and, you can see the, all the exciting things that we have to do. Absolutely. It is a really a very important time, and but we have tools available that allow us, one, to watch this carefully, but also to uh, intervene with 
the uh, outbreak of a new pandemic strain. So I know you're all wrapped up with all the, the media and the hype here, but scientifically, you must find this very exciting, right? It is, it is very, very interesting and full of surprises, yes. And I'm, I'm, I can't wait for the journal articles to start coming out. Yes, there's a lot going on. Peter, thanks so much for talking with me. I, I've heard your phone ringing. I know a lot of people want to talk to you, so I appreciate the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakan. <laughs> Dr. Perlazy, bye. Bye-bye. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>